As you on the front lines of criminal justice know, the federal offender population is increasing, serving longer sentences and requiring more intensive supervision. These changes have created new challenges in probation and pretrial services offices across the country. To help you meet these challenges, the Federal Judicial Center has developed the Special Needs Offenders Series. The series consists of educational products, online conferences, and satellite broadcasts. Each program in the series takes an in-depth look at a unique population. A Special Needs Offender Bulletin outlining the population's general characteristics initiates each program. This is followed by a center-sponsored online conference that builds on the information in the bulletin. Officers share effective case management practices and useful resources. Most programs also include an interactive satellite broadcast that features panel discussions, guest speakers, and video segments to provide current information on the offender population. Now, our first program in the Special Needs Offender Series, an overview of gangs in the federal system. Street gangs, prison gangs, non-traditional organized crime. What are they? How do they affect your work as probation and pretrial services officers? What makes gang members different from other offenders and defendants? What strategies can you use to ensure that gang members successfully comply with the terms of their probation and pretrial services release? What safety issues arise? Gangs is an important topic, but it's also a topic that lends itself to media hype and stereotyping. Most of us have seen movies and news reports of drive-by shootings and other gang-related violence around the country or even in our communities. How accurate are these stories? How do you get past the hype and beyond the stereotypes so you can objectively assess the risks defendants and offenders pose to the community and determine the appropriate conditions and supervision strategies required? Well, these are some of the issues that we'll be examining over the next 90 minutes. I'm Mark Maggio of the Federal Judicial Center, and I'll be your host. Welcome to each of you. You are among more than 3,000 participants at nearly 50 sites across the country who are receiving this program live via satellite broadcast. Now, as you can see from, from your participant guide, the agenda on page numbered Roman numeral 5, today's broadcast is divided into five segments. We'll start with an overview of gangs in the United States from two nationally recognized experts. Then, we'll hear from four probation officers who will fill us in on how they handle gangs in their districts. And we encourage you to ask questions, and we've built in time for them throughout the program. So please phone or fax your questions to us using the toll-free numbers appearing on your screen. Gangs are not a new phenomenon in the United States. One of the first reports of disruptive youth gangs appeared in Philadelphia in 1791. In the 19th century, New York City experienced problems with youth campaigning for the Know Nothing Party and with Irish street gangs that started draft riots during the Civil War. Street gangs emerged in U.S. cities in the course of successive waves of migration, beginning with the movement from farms to cities, followed by waves of foreign immigration. Gangs emerged in communities that were not part of the mainstream. Members of these communities were often overwhelmed by poverty, unemployment, and low levels of social services. They may or may not have had the opportunity for achieving economically as they perceived it. Protection and exploitation of the community were both hallmarks of gang activity. Gangs offered protection and economic opportunities to those who believed, rightly or wrongly, that the larger community would not respond on their behalf. Extortion, random violence, and intimidation, however, were often the price. Many of these same issues arise in current discussions about gangs, including the reasons people give for joining them. A sense of identity and belonging, rules, power, respect, excitement. But things have also changed. There appear to be more gangs and gangs in more cities. Gangs with female members appear to be growing. The variety of gangs and gang structures has grown, making generalizations about them more difficult. In addition, it's sometimes hard to separate general societal trends from those affecting gangs. 
For example, street gang members may be more violent than in the past, but so too are those who aren't involved in gangs. The good news for you is that more resources exist today on gangs than ever before. In this broadcast, we'll explain common terms and concepts that apply to gangs, highlight the need for interagency cooperation, especially between the Bureau of Prisons and, and Probation and Pretrial Services. We'll discuss the impact of gangs in the federal probation and pretrial services. We'll identify safety issues that arise when dealing with gang members. And we'll let you know how to find and evaluate resources so you can create in-district expertise in gangs. And we'll also hear periodically from my colleague, Denise Orlando Morningstar, who conducted the Center's online conference on gangs. Officers from around the country exchanged lots of valuable information during this conference, and Denise will be sharing some of those highlights with us. prisons plays in the management and supervision of gang members. To do this, we'll discuss strategic intelligence and what we mean by it, and the Bureau of Prisons gang management strategy. Now, after we speak with our first guest, we'll take questions, so be sure to phone or fax your questions to us at the numbers on the screen. We'll be getting to the first questions in about five to seven minutes. Our first guest is Craig Trout. Craig is the Bureau of Prisons Liaison to the Counterterrorism Section of the FBI. Prior to this, Craig served as the Chief of Intelligence for the Bureau of Prisons for 10 years. Craig, welcome. Well, thank you. Good to be here. Glad to have you with us. Now, you heard me say in the beginning of the program that we're going to divide this segment into strategic intelligence and operational intelligence. Your role is to get us started and weave us That's through right. the discussion on strategic intelligence. So I'm going to ask you to do that by starting off with a definition of strategic intelligence. Well, I think strategic intelligence is basically the concept of establishing who's out there in the general population. Mm -hmm. What do they look like? How do you recognize them? Are there tattoos, hand signs, colors, or whatever? There might be aids in recognizing who they are. And then in that process, establishing what their specific threat characteristics might be. Then through this process, we establish what we call security threat groups for tracking purposes. Okay, now, now given that definition, um, we know that the Bureau of Prisons has a rather comprehensive gang management strategy. Mm -hmm. So would you take a few moments and talk about that approach? Well, it's a rather complex process, but I think the essential elements are that first we want to canvas the population, as I said, to see who's out there in population. But most important, we want to look at their behavior. We want to look at their, their disciplinary record, look at their activities in the institution. Mm -hmm. Then we want to come up with a ranking system where we can tell which groups pose the greatest threat and then we can customize a gang interdiction strategy for those individual groups. So ranking is a very important uh, piece of the strategy that we know who we should be watching and using our resources to watch them appropriately. Okay, a, a large part of our audience is made up of probation and pretrial services officers. Why would this be important to them? Well, I think over the long term it's going to be very important to them because as we develop this body of information, it's very easy for them to call us directly or possibly call the Sacramento Intelligence Unit and ask very specific in information about a gang that might be of concern mm -hmm. to them, that they're within their caseload, their supervision, or, or getting ready for a pretrial services report. Uh, they may have specific questions about an individual that uh, is in our custody or has been, say he's coming back out to the community and they're wanting uh, additional information. Maybe officer mm -hmm. safety, something to help them with uh, supervision. So we can provide a great deal of information to uh, pretrial and pre uh, services officers. Okay, going back a few steps now. You've mentioned a couple terms, and I want okay. to talk about this briefly. You use the term security threat groups. Now, we're using on this program the, the, the term gangs. Mm -hmm. What's the difference between the two of them? There's not really a difference as such. Gangs are like a subset of the concept of security threat groups. When we talk STGs, or security threat groups, within our agency, mm -hmm. we're talking about all of those groups. In fact, I'll use the, the working definition. Uh, we, we call a security threat group a group of inmates that are acting in concert to threaten the safety of other inmates, mm -hmm. to uh, threaten the safety of staff, uh, the security of the institution, the welfare of the surrounding community, uh, in some cases, even national security. Uh, but the point being is we're tracking them under this umbrella term of which gangs, what we're talking about today, is a subset, subset of that group. term. Okay. It also includes things like domestic terrorists and traditional mafia and mm -hmm. other groups too, but of course today we're talking about gangs. Okay. Let me mention to our audience at this point, on page six of the participant guide, we've got a, a list of the current BOP disruptive threat groups. Uh, I think that's as effective as of April of 97, yes. that's, that's right? Correct. Okay. Yes. Um, 
Okay, so for the purposes of our discussion today, for the broadcast, um, when we talk about gangs, and we're going to be talking about groups such as the Latin Kings, uh, the Texas Syndicate, the right. Bloods and the Crips, what have you. Under the larger umbrella title of security threat groups, which you used, we've got, uh, that includes also like domestic terrorists, international terrorists, and mafia, which we will not necessarily be focusing in on for the day. Right. The other uh, term you mentioned was an organization, the Sacramento Intelligence Unit. Mm -hmm. uh, again, tell us what it is and why it was formed. Well, the Sacramento Intelligence Unit is uh, really an important uh, piece of our intelligence operation. What we've done is set up a intelligence consortium or clearinghouse kind of environment uh, where we have, uh, it's, it's hosted by the Bureau of Prisons, but it's also uh, staffed by uh, U.S. Marshal Service from their mm -hmm. Investigative Services Division. And I think most relevant today, we also have full-time staff from U.S. Probation and Parole. Uh, they're at SIU to help with any uh, inquiries that might come in. Okay, so we have a tri-agency organization here. What can SIU provide to probation and pretrial services? Well, the goal of the SIU is to provide a, a networking ability to, to provide information to any of the member agencies or other agencies that might call, uh, call in. Mm -hmm. So if we have a call from, say, a pretrial services officer, probation or parole, uh, we can provide them detailed information about uh, uh, the various inmates in BOP custody, uh, say their pending release date, uh, threat characteristics, officer safety issues, what they can expect in the community. We can help them uh, uh, with their, their plan in terms of how to supervise the individual. We provide a whole wealth of information to them. Okay. Now we're highlighting interagency cooperation here. Right. On the flip side of the question, what can probation and pretrial services officers provide to SIU? Well, I was, a I was hoping that you'd ask me that because obviously for SIU to be fully effective, it means full participation by everyone involved. So if, if uh, probation and pretrial services officers contribute information, if they call us and give us information about inmates in the pipeline coming to us, we build that baseline, we build that database of information, and there's a greater likelihood that we're going to be able to provide meaningful, timely, effective information later on when they call for assistance uh, further during the period of incarceration or supervised release. Okay. You've got us off to a good start on strategic intelligence, and we're going to be taking some questions in a few minutes. I have a question I want, I want to ask you about. Okay. Um, getting to the, the issue of strategic intelligence, or actually, the, I'm sorry, the Sacramento Intelligence Unit. Um, and that, that question quickly escaped me. I'm going to come back to that. Give me a second. Let me give you a question from our online conference, okay. and maybe that will jar my memory. Certainly. Um, can we as officers make contact with the various prison intelligence officers who can give us up-to-date information on a supervised releasee. For example, could I contact the intelligence officer at FCI Sandstone and have him let me know who is on the defendant's visiting list, who's sending him money, who's writing to him, et cetera? Absolutely. We encourage uh, uh, those kind of inquiries. They can be directly to the institution. If they have a reason to call the institution, they would ordinarily speak to the special investigative supervisor, which is, we normally call that the SIS. But rather than trying to remember who they should call and, and what to ask for and whatever, uh, they might want to call SIU first, and we can kind of facilitate that contact where they either talk to them direct or we gather the information for them and provide it or whatever. Uh, but yes, those kind of uh, inquiries are very welcome, of course. Okay. I knew it would jar on my memory. It came okay. back to the question. Um, officers that, per, that, that contact SIU regularly, or hopefully after the end of this program, will begin contacting mm -hmm. SIU on a regular basis. The information they provide, um, for lack of a better phrase, is, is this a, sort of a garbage in, garbage out type of thing? If, if SIU or BOP gets bad information, um, is, is this a problem for them as they begin to track? So it's important for officers to uh, to focus in on the, on the information that they're providing. Um, so as good as what they give is as good as what they get, I guess is what I'm getting to, say, getting to the point. Well, I think what we really focus on at SIU is a really a quality control kind of concept. We're going to use all source collection. We're going to be talking to FBI, to local law enforcement, look at our own BOP okay. intelligence. We're going to look at as many sources as possible. And we'll go through kind of a quality control kind of process to make sure we're accurate, timely, uh, pro providing effective information. So if, an, uh, if someone does contribute uh, information that needs further development, we'll certainly look at it and make sure that we've made it as accurate and timely as we possibly okay, can. Okay, so you're going you're to corroborate what you get from the officers as well and then track the information going in and when it comes out, you've got good solid information for the officers. When Absolutely. It, when these Absolutely. Come out. Yes. Um, okay, you've, like I said, you've gotten us off to a good start and uh, we're going to uh, take our time out now. That's all we have for questions right now, and we'll be getting to more of them soon and later in the broadcast. Before moving on to our discussion of operational intelligence, 
we're going to be hearing now the first of our reports on the online conference from Denise Orlando Morningstar. So, Denny? Thanks, Mark. This fall, over 95 officers met during an online conference to discuss identifying and supervising offenders and defendants who are members of a gang. An online conference is really similar to an internet chat room, but not everyone has to be logged on the computer at the same time. Now, during the conference, the officers share information, strategies, and resources. Some of the officers who participate in the conference have actually seen gangs in their communities and have extensive experience dealing with these individuals. Other officers were just beginning to see gangs in their communities. In some cases, officers weren't even sure if they had gang members on their caseload. And in fact, identification is a real issue when dealing with this offender population. As one participant noted, identifying gang members is getting more difficult. In Utah, we have noticed that a lot of street gang members are steering away from their traditional colors. Another said, there are few fail-proof methods for determining whether a person is a member of a gang, and it's equally as important to identify gang associates, affiliates, and wannabes. Foolproof identification methods are hard to come by, but during the next segment of the broadcast, we're going to give you some pointers on what to do if you think someone on your caseload is a gang member. Well, now that we've addressed strategic intelligence, let's move on to our discussion of operational intelligence. And here, we'll define operational intelligence, we'll learn about the National Major Gang Task Force and the services that it provides, and we'll pinpoint several specific factors to take into account when supervising known gang members or offenders and, def offenders and defendants, rather, excuse me, who you suspect are gang members. Now, we'll have another question and answer session in about 20 minutes, so be sure to keep your calls and your faxes coming in. Well, I'd now like to introduce our second guest, joining Craig and me in the studio, is Dale Welling. Dale's a private consultant and executive director of the National Major Gang Task Force. He was with federal probation for 20 years and then transferred to the Bureau of Prisons as the first chief of the Sacramento Intelligence Unit. Dale, welcome to you. Mark, how are you? Glad you're, w glad you're able to join glad us today. Glad to be here. Um, before I get you into the operational intelligence discussion, we're going to go back a few years to your days as a, as a probation officer. Now, the title of this program, An Overview of Gangs in the Federal System, is part of the larger series that we're calling a Special Needs Offender Series. And we took the term Special Needs Offenders from the Probation and Pretrial Services System. So my question for you is, what makes gang members Special Needs Offenders? But when I was a probation officer, that was you know several years, several a years few ago. Years, a few years ago, <laughs> we, we dealt with the individual, and uh, with the offender, you would interview him, you'd interview his family, uh, you talk to uh, maybe employers, possibly neighbors, uh, you'd give counseling and advice, uh, and eventually, hopefully, he would internalize these controls and become a productive, law-abiding citizen. Mm -hmm. Today, we have the new element of gangs. And it changes the whole complexion of supervision on the street as well as supervision in a prison environment. With gangs, in many situations, a gang member, his family, is the gang. Okay. And you have an, uh, an outside influence that you didn't have before. You're dealing not only not a, in, with just the group or individual, but you're dealing with a group. And so with the outside peer pressure, there's a bigger likelihood that he will violate his conditions of supervision, uh, be more violent, move guns or drugs, that type of thing that he wouldn't be involved with as an individual. Okay. Now it's your turn to go on the hot seat. Define operational intelligence for us. Operational intelligence is what's happening right now. When Craig uh, talked about uh, strategic intelligence, as a probation officer, that would be similar to getting the case file, opening it up, and doing a case plan. This is what you're going to do with the case. Operational intelligence is what is happening with the case at the moment. And this could be uh, an example would be that uh, you go and talk to the offender and mm -hmm. he says he's living here and he's working here. And uh, you think, well, I, I want to double check on that. So you go to the local police department and they say, oh, no, uh, he says he's living there. Well, he's actually living across town with another, lady, or another girlfriend. Uh, he's dealing meth. Uh, manufacturing meth, mm -hmm. uh, moving it all over the state. 
that would be supplementing the information that, that the offender is telling you. So operational intelligence is actually supplemental information that helps you ma better manage the case. Dale, you've had an opportunity as a member of the National Major Gang Task Force, executive director rather, uh, to travel around the country and do quite a bit of training. Are there common questions, common concerns that you hear from officers throughout, whether you're in New York, Omaha, Los Angeles, that uh, sort of, you know, running theme, a recurring theme for that? Probably the question you get more than anything else is, what does this mean? Uh, and that would be drawings, it would be graffiti, uh, uh, could be hand signs, uh, tattoos. And what I find is that officers don't know what they're looking at. Some of it is very significant, some of it is not. And when we talk about the impact, officers don't understand the impact. Mm -hmm. uh, if you have uh, a sign or symbol that's upside down, which is disrespect, or if it's crossed out, uh, it tells you uh, what's going on in the neighborhood. Graffiti is the newspaper of the street. And so not understanding the impact and not, and not knowing what it is, it kind of puts you on the outside. Uh, the third thing is not knowing wh where to go to get the information and the resources that, that you have available to you, which is a whole vast network out there that you can go to. Okay, let me jump on that last point then. As the executive director of the, of the task force, um, can officers come to you? And if so, what can they expect from the National Major Gang Task Force? Yes, they can. Uh, we are a, a national network of uh, correctional information. And we're a task force. We're not an association. Okay. Uh, but if officers need information, they can call us. And we're like brokers of information. Uh, we put out security alerts, officer safety bulletins, newsletters. But more than that, uh, we deal f focus on the, on the state and local level. Uh, but if you need information, say you're an officer in Illinois and you need information out of the Washington Department of Correction, we can put you in, in direct contact with a gang investigator that you may not yet, if you send a collateral contact to Washington State to another probation officer to contact the Department of Corrections. We can get you inside the closed community, so to speak. Okay. Now I'm going to give you a chance, to, a little bit of a plug here. I know the National Major <laughs> Gang Task Force has a lot of national training programs they're running. And you've got one coming up, I think, in Daytona? Yes, is that correct? Uh, Daytona, Florida in uh, May of next year of 88. It'll be our fourth national conference. Uh, it's an excellent time for officers uh, to network uh, across the nation, uh, here leading uh, gang experts, making presentations on trends and management strategies uh, for security threat groups uh, on the street and in the institution. Uh, last time we had, uh, in Colorado Springs, we had 550 participants from 32 mm -hmm. states. So it's a, they're major correctional conferences. Okay. Let me uh, pose this question to you and Craig. The National Major Gang Task Force, we've heard about <coughs> briefly, Sacramento Intelligence Unit. Is this an either-or situation for officers? In other words, you go to one or the other. How do they complement? How do they differ from one another? Well, it's not really either-or. When, when they call the Sacramento Intelligence Unit, they're going to get a lot of information that's based on on federal information from the Bureau of Prisons, from the Marshals, from the FBI, from, from whatever. And as Dale was pointing out, National Major Gang Task Force has outstanding contacts in the various states in some of the major counties like Dade County or Los Angeles County or whatever. So what we'd really encourage them to do is blend all of that information available, blend the intelligence available from the various sources. So it's not an either or, we'd really encourage them to call both. But if, if they call one or the other frequently, we're going to help them with that. Uh, uh, with that networking also. But okay, uh, so they're really designed the two organizations to complement one another. Exactly, exactly right. Exactly. Let, me, let me mention, take a moment to mention to our audience again. On pages 20 and 21 of your participant guide also, there are logos, the mailing information, the telephone numbers that you can use to call both the Ma National Major Gang Task Force and the Sacramento Intelligence Unit. Uh, coming back, Craig, for SIU, for our non-Fed uh, mm -hmm. uh, participants that are out in, in our audience, um, SIU is a resource for them as well? Absolutely. That's the reason it's effective is that because we encourage all the various jurisdictions to call, and it increases our database, increases our baseline information. So not only do uh, we uh, welcome their calls, we encourage it because it helps us build our database, our understanding of the various gangs out there. So they're very welcome to call. We encourage them to. Okay. Let's go down another road. Um, in my discussions with both of you in preparing for the program, uh, one of the things I learned is that as you travel around the country, the officers do ask questions that they seem to be looking for uh, the macro answer, the big solution, or like we saw, <laughs> the big cahoon of all this, how to manage these, this offender population. So using that as a segue, 
Uh, I do know from talking with you that there are special considerations that probation and pretrial services officers need to uh, focus on when dealing with this offender mm -hmm. population, and I'm going to ask you to start highlighting some of those. Craig, let's start with you. Well, I think the first one that jumps to mind is the need to stay current. Uh, gang dynamics are changing constantly, where you see new feuds, you see uh, new alliances, uh, you see various gangs on the move or whatever. Mm -hmm. So it's very important they stay very current in the current situation. There might be new leaders emerging, uh, new problems emerging in their city. So as we look out across the country, we see a, a rapidly changing situation. Uh, for instance, if we were to look out to, say, the West Coast, uh, out in California, for instance, we see the Aryan Brotherhood uh, starting to distance themselves a little bit from the Mexican Mafia. Traditionally, they've been very close allies. Now, they're not at war right now, but they're distancing themselves a little bit. The Mexican Mafia mm -hmm. uh, is uh, having some difficulties. Aryan Brotherhood's distancing. If you are to look, say, to Texas, uh, we used to have the Texas Syndicate and the Mexican Army at war, at open war for years. And now we find themselves in a, in a, in a brand new alliance where they're actually allies and uh, 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 operating in each other's uh, best interest. Uh, when you move up to, say, the New England area, you have emerging groups such as the Latin Kings, the various factions from, say, New York or Massachusetts or Connecticut or whatever. Mm -hmm. You have the Latin Kings, then you also have other rapidly emerging groups like Los Salidos. And it's kind of a kind of a hot and cold relationship. You have to be very current to, to know whether they're currently having difficulties between the various factions or whether they're, they're currently at peace or, or have a treaty. And when you go to some of the other uh, traditional areas, such as, say, um, well, Chicago, for instance, uh, Black Anxious Disciple uh, Nation has recently gone through major changes as a result of their, their recent indictment and prosecution of their top leadership structure. They're reinventing themselves, trying to get their balance again with the loss of so many leaders to prosecution. The same thing's uh, true of the El Rukans, uh, where you had a number of successful prosecutions and whatever, so you see them trying to reinvent themselves. So I think they're, they may be uh, uh, going back to their old name, Black, Black Peastone Nation, and some of their older uh, uh, strategies uh, prior to being El Rukin. So it's changing quickly. I'm starting to appreciate the need for staying current just listening to you. Absolutely. Okay, so we're staying current. What's the next point? Well, I think another one that's very, very important is you need to be as specific as possible. Uh, when you're looking at an issue, uh, oftentimes we're dealing with groups that operate in alignments, such mm -hmm. as Crips or Black Anxious Disciples or Vice Lords or whatever. But when we're looking at an issue involving a gang, we need to be as specific as possible. What faction, what crew, what set, what posse? Very specifically, who are we dealing with? And I'd even go further on that. I would even say what part of town. For instance, Chicago, when you're talking Latin Kings, there might be some difference between North Side Latin Kings and South Side Latin Kings mm -hmm. within the same city. Mm -hmm. So we need to be very, very specific. Same thing goes to tattoos. Not just ge general tattoos and whatever, but we need to be very specific details. What tattoos, what colors, how are the hand signs used, as much uh, specificity as possible. Okay, so we're being, uh, being current, we're staying current, we're being specific. Third point. Well, I think one that's always been very important to me is to make sure that we're looking at behavior and not just visibility. You'll see some gangs, for instance, that are very, very active with hand signs and colors and graffiti. You'll see the aerosol internet down the back alleys where they put the graffiti all the, the, aerosol the, internet. All the way down Great the back term. of the warehouses Great and term. things like that. And you see this bigger than life presence in the city mm -hmm. where you would convince that this, uh, all this uh, graffiti represents the largest gang that you've ever seen. Where, in contrast, you might see a street-level drug trafficking organization, a gang who's selling crack down on the street corner, extremely dangerous, very, very violent, but they're not using colors, hand signs, graffiti, those kind of things. So when you're developing a gang strategy and you're developing what, you, what intelligence you might need about the various groups in your caseload, make sure you're looking at gangs that are dangerous, the, the behavior, rather than concentrating, uh, concentrating on just how uh, visible they might be. Okay. Dale, let me, let me get you to jump in the fray here. We're staying current, we're being specific, we're c focusing on criminal behavior and not just visibility. The last point I think would be all source collection. Mm -hmm. uh, you don't take one piece and make it a fact. Uh, you would call SIU, uh, call uh, the National Major Gang Task Force, uh, talk to local law enforcement, mm -hmm. uh, you know, state resources, uh, the uh, uh, community uh, uh, resources, whatever they may be, uh, health agencies and whatever. Mm -hmm. Also, on the internet, it's a great research. Uh, if you, the Black Gangster Disciples have an internet site, the Latin Kings, a new one out the of Florida. Are getting their own web pages. That's right. right. That's right. So uh, you, you go to the, go to the, uh, the, the uh, internet, 
Uh, but it's really important, and I, and I think we both stressed the quality control is what is really important because you don't want to misidentify and, and put bad information out. Okay, now I know the last point, although that you said that was the last point. This is actually the last point. <laughs> don't look for a gang member behind every door. It's something you shared with us, and I, I love it. Tell us what it means. Craig and I both have done a lot of training around the country. And after you've made a presentation, uh, people will, uh, will come up and they'll ask questions and, and then they leave and they go back to their work site. Well, one thing we say is don't find a gang member behind every cell door or every uh, street corner. Uh, because what happens, it's so dynamic and, 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 you, and everybody kind of gets warmed up in the moment. And then you go out and you find things that aren't there. And you don't want to overreact. You don't want to create something that's not there. You don't want to alarm the staff. You don't want to you know, scare your people. But you have to be objective. You have to go out, and if it's there, you deal with it. But you don't want to be an alarmist about it. Okay. You mentioned quality control. And you've introduced, you've brought us, you've given us the, the gang validation criteria, which, again, I'll take a moment and mention to our audience, is on pages 9 and 10 of the participant guide. Tell us what the gang validation criteria is and how is it used. The document uh, that, that's in the bulletin is modeled after the Federal Bureau of Prisons, but it's uh, produced by the National Major Gang Task Force. It's not only the Bureau of Prisons, but it's, it's a uh, from all the other agencies and their input as far as how do you validate a gang member. Mm -hmm. uh, it's very important that you validate uh, something that will stand up in court. Uh, if you're going to take adverse action against a uh, offender or uh, an inmate, I, and you do it, it's behavior driven, but also because he's a gang member and you have it validated, then you have some substantiation for, for your actions. And then also uh, you have like cl different classifications. There's uh, a, a member, a validated member. Uh, there's a, 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 an associate, there's a suspect, there's a, a wannabe, there's a throwaway. And a so th you- oh, wait, a, a throwaway? <laughs> That's right, a throwaway. We're gonna come back to that term. Okay, go ahead. <laughs> So you need to know where they are in, in the classification process. So it's a quality control document, so you're not just throwing it out and saying, okay, there's three, in, or there's three individuals standing on a street corner. Two of them are, two of them are gang members, so the third one's got to be. Uh, that's not necessarily true. Okay. Mm -hmm. All right. Wannabes, I think I understand. Throwaways. Let's, let's build on that a little bit. Tell me about these folks. A throwaway is, is someone who wants to become a member of the gang. Uh, if you were supervising a throwaway, you would think he was a wannabe. Uh, but a throwaway is uh, an, an offender or an inmate that is uh, used by the gang. They have no intention of ever bringing him in as a gang member. Hmm. And they'll say, you're up, you're up, you know, like you're up for the vote or the, we're going to bring you in. And so hmm. he'll do anything. He'll move guns and drugs. He'll uh, uh, murder contracts, whatever the gang wants him to do. He's like a little puppy dog. Yes, whatever you want me to do, I'll do it. And uh, when they're finished with him, then they just throw him away, which means he has to leave town. They may kill him. It depends on how, how much he knows about the gang. And if he's, it's a minor thing he's done for the gang, they'll just say, we don't want you anymore. How do you differ, or if you can, between the throwaway and the wannabe? I mean, when you're, when you're, if I'm an officer on the street, and I'm, how do I know? It's very difficult. There were times that we would call uh, an officer and say, well, you're, you're dealing with a, uh, a suspected gang member or an associate, but we think he's a throwaway. And, uh, and they'll say, well, this guy's so dumb, nobody want him in their gang, you know? <laughs> and so I said, well, he's probably a throwaway. <laughs> and many times that would be the case, but mm -hmm. it's very hard to tell. Wow, that's, that's, that's fascinating. Let me go back to the gang validation criteria for a minute. Um, in my obsessive compulsive style, admittedly, um, I totaled up the points on the gang validation criteria. I think I came up with 78 points. I noticed at the top of the criteria, it indicates uh, 10 points, I think, right. to, uh, to validate an individual. 10 out of 78, that seems a little low. Could you kind of explain that a little bit? It's cumulative. Uh, if he's validated at 10 points, then you have a validated gang member. Mm -hmm. Then if it goes up higher than that, say uh, 40 points, 50 points or whatever, he's more active, he's more visible. But that doesn't necessarily mean that he's a leader, because a lot of the leaders may only have 10 points or 12 points and just be very validated, but they're sitting back and they're calling the shots. 
But as, we, as we've said about the throwaway, the wannabes are the most dangerous. Those are the ones that are going to be out there that are going to have the higher points because they're the most active in the gang. So you have to watch everything on the spectrum. So wannabes are most dangerous for whom? For the officer. For the officers. Uh, as far as uh, you know, carrying things out for the gang, actually uh, doing things for the gang. Uh, the leaders normally are not out in front. Like uh, a wannabe, an initiation me may mean to assault a, a correctional officer in a, in, a, in a prison system, or it may be to assault a, a probation officer on the next home visit to show heart. And so they, you need to be aware, you know, if they are a wannabe yeah. or an associate, yeah, because they're, they're very dangerous. So, okay, let's, let's clarify a little bit. The gang validation criteria, I've got an individual I think is a gang member. Um, we could have the leader of the gang, ten, I mean, just this hypothetically, score 10 points. We yeah. come up with 10 points on there. And yet this person is really much, you know, pretty much heading up the operation. And yet a wannabe, because if I'm understanding correctly, the level of activity we're seeing, mm -hmm. we could see upwards, well, obviously in excess of 10. Yeah, actually he would be a member by that time when we say validated, but, but the wannabe and the younger gang members would have a higher score because they're actually doing things for the gang. Okay. Craig, does the BOP use the gang validation criteria? Yes, absolutely. We uh, uh, have been using it for since the middle uh, 1980s. And prior to that time, we just uh, used a system where we had, uh, say, three observations would result in, in a, a, a person being validated as a gang member. But we realized it was useful to give point values to various observations. Like we might give so many points to self-admission, a different point value to possession of gang materials, a much higher point value for actually writing gang correspondence or writing gang instructions or whatever, and another point value so for, say, interagency intelligence. So the way we designed it, no one criteria by itself will result in validation. It typically takes three or four. But let me also add to that that even though you've reached the validation point of 10 points, we'd encourage the officers to continue to collect against as many as the criteria as possible. You know, always want to use all source collection and use as many observations as possible so that you kind of corroborate the information, quality control kind of uh, uh, process. So I, I use this, this validation criteria, this person sitting in front of me and we go through the questions, I mean, or is this something you just, as you investigate, as you use all source collection, you're you're marking this off as you find out the information and corroborate. Is that the way that works? Over a period of time, you gather right. the information and, you and wherever, wherever it comes from. But if you notice when it says uh, membership uh, and he admits it, right. mm -hmm. uh, we don't take that as that he is a member. You don't take it as gospel. No, no because he well, may have a want of it. They'll do that, you're right, and okay. he'll do that to manipulate. Uh, it, it could be for very many reasons that he will admit. Uh, and then the other side of it is that. Uh, as they realize that being a gang member is going to be detrimental to their supervision plan or their custody placement, then they'll start denying it. Mm -hmm. And then they'll say, oh, well, I, I, I'm not a gang member, but I, but I sure, you know, I grew up with them or I've been around them mm -hmm. for a number of years. And so they'll start denying it and they'll start going underground. And the gangs that are more serious and are actually into conducting serious gang business are not going to be in your face and they're going to be a lot lower profile. Who developed the criteria? Well, we developed it in the Bureau of Prisons uh, uh, some years ago in the middle 1980s, but uh, then we worked with the National Major Gang Task Force to blend in some ideas for some other states and whatever so that we could come up with a model document that would be useful across a wide variety of jurisdictions, be it uh, state, local, whatever. So uh, what we see in the work uh, guide today is similar to the federal uh, uh, criteria, uh, but it's uh, actually a model for all jurisdictions. One thing I would suggest when, <clears throat> because this is being adopted nationwide, uh, when an officer is talking to a, a law enforcement officer or a, you know, ga a gang unit, or particularly in a, a prison setting, mm -hmm. if you're talking to Bureau of Prisons or you're, or you're talking to your state correctional agency, ask if he's a validated member. Uh, b because that way you know he's gone through this process. Mm -hmm. if it's not just somebody saying, oh, well, he's a gang member. You actually have a process that they've gone through. And then if they, they say, no, he's a suspected member, but he's not validated, at least you know the language and you know what they're talking about. Okay. I could take this conversation on to the next hour, but we've got lots to cover. <laughs> you guys ready to take some questions? Let's do you it. Bet. Let's okay. do it. We've got a fax. Um, I don't have the location. Oh, okay. This is from uh, Eastern District of New York. Question, how can we obtain information on active Hispanic gangs? Are there any known Colombian or other Hispanic gangs known besides the Mexican Mafia? 
I am an officer covering a largely Hispanic and I apologize, I uh, can't make out that word, neighborhood where drugs are prevalent. What district is he from? Eastern District of New York. Uh, one of the large groups there, uh, probably Nietas. The Nietas? The Nietas, yes. uh, P P uh, Puerto Rican. Latin Kings are, are real heavy there. Uh, in fact, there was a conflict between uh, Almighty Latin Charter Nation in Connecticut and Almighty Latin Kings uh, that are controlled out of Chicago in the New York area. So yes, there are, there are a lot, but the major ones, wouldn't you say, Craig, are uh, uh, Latin Kings and Los Salitos? And uh, Los Trinita and Trinitarios, uh, and and a, a, a various other groups like that. Uh, quite a bit of information is available on that. I, I would encourage him to call in and, and get more details as he needs them, but there's quite a bit of information available on that. Okay. Mm -hmm. Got other facts for you. Once again, from the Eastern District, New York. Thank you, EDNY. <laughs> in clarification, for information to be provided to SIU, should there be some formal corroboration of gang affiliation, i.e., defendant, offender, acknowledgement, court acknowledgement, etc., or should suspicion of gang affiliation by the officer uh, be provided? And we have a little sub question here. I'll give, give that to you in a second, but go ahead and. Well, I think that, that kind of fits into my comment I made a little earlier about being specific. They should provide as specifically as possible what they have. If they have a self admission, if they have a an observation, let's say when they did a home visit and saw something in the, in the home or, or they have interagency intelligence, say from another police department, uh, it's helpful to be as specific as possible on what they have. Uh, so if they could provide as much as they have, it uh, would help us in the quality control process, also help us in understanding their exact needs and, and be able to blend that intelligence into other intelligence that we have. Okay. Sub-question. Dale, this may go to you. Does the presumption of innocence of, of pretrial defendants impact upon the uh, it looks like the provision of information yes uh, there's certain you know they're, they're not convicted they're pretrial exactly the right. presumption of innocence so pretrial. Uh, right. uh, when I was with uh, SIU and also a federal probation officer uh, we try to provide as much information as we can within the guidelines uh, and within the policy and procedures and, and, and protect the rights of the defendant uh, so there, there are certain restrictions, and that's what you need to do is check with your local jurisdiction to find out what you can do uh, and what information can be released, what information cannot be released. Okay. Dale, let me, let me try and run this by you. Um, this is always a danger <laughs> when we take live questions. Uh, one of the benefits of having, uh, and it looks like an officer or a unit of officers specifically supervising gang members versus assigning gang-related cases to the specialist officer who have limited gang experience. I we well, should say who may have limited <laughs> gang experience. We should have if that, I uh, understand the correct uh, yeah. question, it's whether you, sh you should have a gang unit that is assigned, the uh, assigned gang members mm -hmm. or, or a gang, uh, like a special offender specialist. I think, yeah. I think that's where we're going with this. Uh, yeah, I, you really need to have specialized gang people. Uh, because, as I said, you know, they don't know what, if you send it to a regular officer, they don't understand the dynamics, they don't understand the feuds and treaties. Uh, mm -hmm. it's, it's especially all in itself. And you need somebody that would be like the, the district uh, or office expert who would supervise and meet those special needs. And uh, that way, I think that you'll hear that from, a, from operation officers later, that you, have, that you really, to be effective, need to have special units. Okay. Um, you mentioned feuds and treaties, and, and Craig walked us around the country a little bit very nicely and talked about some specific gangs. Mm -hmm. And I remember when we talked about the need to stay current. Uh, and if you, if, you, if you don't recall at this point, please tell me. From an operational standpoint, feuds, treaties, that are other feuds and treaties that are going on at this point that you might be familiar with? Yes, uh, and it's very important for the officer so he's not caught mm -hmm. in the crossfire. Uh, you have, uh, like the... Uh, well, the, the Aryan Brotherhood and the Mexican Mafia, which have been in the line for a number of years, Missus in California, you know, separating. Uh, you, you have uh, the uh, Mexican Army and the Texas Syndicate have been at war for a number of years, uh, and that's in Texas, that, that Mexican Army being the Texas Mexican Mafia. Mm -hmm. uh, they are now tr coming together. Mm -hmm. uh, in, on the East Coast, uh, uh, the Latin Kings and Los Salidos, and, I, but the, it's wherever you are in the country, you need to be aware of the treaties, who's working with who, and who's at war. But, but not only mm -hmm. that, is that w we can say this today, and that can change uh, next week, or it can change in six months. So when you think they're, they're, that they're getting along, 
you may drive into the neighborhood and find out that they're that they're not at all and be mm -hmm. caught right in the middle. So it's, it's critical that the officers be aware of how the gangs are aligned and okay. and how imp you know how they impact Absolutely. each other. I'm just going to take a moment and first I'll thank our audience for the facts questions. They're great, but please uh, make use of the phone. We want to hear you live if, if uh, you're so inclined to do so. Use the uh, the telephone number that should be coming up on your screen now. And and uh, take a moment to phone in a call. We can go live on the air with you. I've got uh, some questions as I threw back. I, I threw one at, at Craig quickly in the first part of the segment. I'm going to come back from our online conference that I mentioned that uh, Denise Landa Morningstar uh, facilitated earl earlier in uh, this fall. Um, I'm going to pick one that I want from the district. Uh, this is this came from Florida Northern. It says our district is compar comprised of large rural areas. How are the big city gangs spreading to the smaller towns? Well, I think one of the things that we're seeing uh, the offenders coming into BOP custody as we look through their PSIs and their criminal record and whatever, we find that they may have been based out of, say, South Central Los Angeles or maybe Chicago or whatever. Uh, but as the police pressure increases on them or as they uh, uh, have other uh, reasons why they might want to expand, they may literally go on what amounts to a road trip where they get on the interstate, they go down to exit 53, go down to the Howard Johnson or whatever, and they may set up and sell drugs for say two, three days to the local small jurisdiction finally realizes there's really unusual traffic going into that, uh, that uh, hotel area, that motel area, and they gather up, pack up, go on down the road. Uh -huh. So I think the point to learn from all this is we shouldn't fall in the trap of thinking, well, gee, I'm in rural Georgia or rural Nebraska or whatever, it doesn't affect me. Chances are excellent it does. The Black Inks Disciples or the Vice Lords or the Rolling Sixty Crips or whatever, if they're not there now, they might be in the future, and whether it's a permanent presence or whether it's just passing through in the interstate, setting up for a two or three day operation mm -hmm. in a local motel and selling and moving on, uh, we can almost guarantee, and in fact, looking at our own BOP records, we can almost guarantee that, for instance, the vice lords and black anxious disciples are down in Florida and Georgia and Mississippi and all that. We should fall in the trap of thinking they're Chicago. Same with uh, Rolling Sixty Crips. I've seen uh, various evidence of uh, Crip members right here in Washington, D.C. Okay. Again, we could, t we could take this conversation on forever, but unfortunately, we're not going to. <laughs> uh, and thank you again to our audience for faxing the questions, and that's it for this segment. It's now time for our program break. And when we come back, we'll be talking with four federal probation officers we will discuss their experiences identifying and supervising gang members. So be sure and join us for that, and we'll see you in seven minutes.